And Lord, we pray today as we look into the holy, infallible, inerrant, only Word of God. We pray today that you'd bless the preaching of your Word and bring forth fruit for the kingdom of God. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have your Bibles this morning. We're back in 1 Timothy. We started a series of messages. We're preaching through 1 Timothy. And today we'll be looking in verses uh, 1, 18 through 20. 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. And then we'll also be looking at another passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. But uh, the, the title of this message is Fighting Heresy in the Church. Fighting Heresy in the Church. And so, 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul says, This commandment I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keep faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus, and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Now, if you will, look over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 16. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it leads to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetius, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they, set, uh, and the, and they upset the faith of some. So let's look at fighting heresy in the church. How important is Biblical doctrine, sound biblical doctrine. Well, this morning I want us to take a look at that because it's probably the most important thing we do is to teach the Bible. And uh, uh, people, when they get the, the, the wrong idea about what the Scripture teaches, then they'll have the wrong behavior following that teaching. I once knew a man, uh, he was a, a song leader at our church, music director, and he was a wonderful man. He, he had a very powerful testimony. He could sing that song. I don't know if some of y'all Southern gospel people know that song, Beulah Land. Man, he could, he could bring tears to everybody's eyes. He was a very talented, gifted young man. And uh, he, he uh, fell in with some people who taught false doctrine. And uh, one night he invited me to one of their meetings and he wanted me to preach. And I did. And I got about the same response I normally do, uh, uh, not much. And uh, uh, then he got up to, uh, to lead the music. And through the music, things began to change. And uh, uh, the next thing you know, there was just a, a whole bunch of activity going on. I saw some children in the back. They were frightened by what they saw. And there was this guy that came there in a wheelchair and uh, he drove up in a Cadillac, and uh, I found out later that he visited all these meetings and did this, and so he rolled up to the front, and suddenly everybody surrounded him, and they were going to try to heal him in that wheelchair, and it just became a regular scene, and about the time they began to, uh, I guess, uh, come to the conclusion that he wasn't going to get up, they'd calm down. Well, he'd start yelling like he was going to try to get up, and they'd start all over again, I left. I walked out, and uh, this young man followed me out, this leader, the, this song leader, and he asked me, he said, what's the matter? I said, what's going on in there is not of God. He said, well, what is it then? I said, it's the flesh. And I said, every time y'all stop praying or start getting tired, he starts yelling more, and it starts all over again. I said, he's not going to get up. Y'all are not going to see him healed here tonight. Now, that man did not believe what I said. He did not believe they were preaching false doctrine. As a result of that, he was led astray into all kinds of false other things. And uh, the problem was uh, I could not convince him that I was teaching him the truth or what the Word of God said on some of these issues. 
Now, I believe in healing. I believe God heals all the time. And so it's not healing that I was objecting to. What I was objecting to is somebody telling God what he has to do. That's the problem. But the central truth of this message this morning is pastors and churches are commanded to oppose heresy. We're not supposed to be neutral about it. We're not supposed to not mention it. We are supposed to actively oppose heresy. Pastors and churches, amen? And so I want you to see two or three things from this passage. First off, I want you to see the charge to fight heresy. The charge in verse 3, the introduction, Paul says there, that I left you at Ephesus, and this is the charge, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine. The word strange means different, distorted, or false doctrine. Then in verse 18, Paul picks it back up, looking back at verse 3, saying, this charge, and notice what he says at the last part of verse 18, this command, this charge, I entrusted to you to fight the good fight. That's the charge, fight the good fight. And so uh, the simple meaning of heresy, the simple meaning of the word heresy is to make distinctions. In other words, a heretic is someone who brings up a subject or creates a situation where people in the congregation have to pick sides. It's a divisive tactic of the heretic. And so uh, let's just talk about heresy for a few minutes. The, uh, first off, before we even look at the heresy, most church conflict, most church conflict is sinful, okay? Most church conflict is sinful. Uh, when I was in seminary, Dr. Terry Wise uh, defined church conflict as this way. Now, this is a wonderful definition. It's very simple, but listen. Conflict is when two people want to occupy the same space at the same time. Now, that, that's it. That, all conflict resolves into that, those two things in church. And uh, I've come to believe that it is normally the case of most church conflicts. Now, when you think of space, I'm talking about a title. I'm talking about a position of leadership. I'm talking about control over a certain aspect. I'm talking about territories in the church. I'm talking about spaces like church buildings. Conflict arises around finances, agendas, programs, uh, calendars. Two people have strong conflicting opinions about what ought to happen in that space, and it sets off conflict. And all, all, all of that type of conflict is a work of the flesh and is sinful. Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, the Apostle Paul addressing the uh, Corinthian believers, they had that kind of conflict. He said, servants of God, as a matter of fact, my brothers and sisters, I could not talk to you as, as people who have the Spirit. Paul said, I can't even talk to you like saved people. I had to talk to you like you belong to the world, as, as, uh, as children, infants in the Christian faith. I had to feed you with milk and not solid food because you're not ready for it. Even now you're not ready for it because, here's how he knows, because you still have people who live like the world. When there's jealousy among you and quarreling with one another, doesn't that prove that you're acting like the world? And so all of that kind of conflict that happens sometimes in a congregation is always sinful. Now, often we think of heresy and we associate that word with false teaching, false teaching. And it is most certainly heresy to teach false teaching. However, the heretic is not just the person who teaches false teaching, but the heretic is somebody who promotes division in the congregation. Uh, let's call them a social heretic rather than a scriptural heretic. And that's my term. But it's just somebody who uses, most often people use traditions. Traditions. Uh, I divide up a lot of people. Uh, uh, by traditions, I mean any long-standing procedure held by some members of the congregation. Tradition, long-standing procedures held by the congregation. Somebody said Baptists don't have traditions. They just do the same thing over and over again. Well, that's what I'm talking about, okay? Have you ever seen that happen? Somebody suggests changing something, and 
there'll be one or two people that just flip out like it's the end of the world. Somebody said, uh, that's what happens when, when you change things. And sadly, sometimes some divisive person who is a heretic comes into a congregation and when somebody suggests changing something that's not scriptural, not biblical, it's just something that people do and, and it's time to make a change, that heretic will raise the eyes in the congregation. The next thing you know, they'll start whispering, they'll start spreading stuff, and the Bible says, says in Proverbs 16, uh, there are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet that run swiftly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and he who sows discord among brethren. And so God hates division in the body of Christ. And as believers in the body of Christ, we must always check our own motives. We've got to check ourselves. Uh, what, what, what we as leaders need to do is we need to, we need to ask ourselves, is, are, are what we doing, is it biblical? Are what we doing, is it scriptural? Is the Holy Spirit leading this, or is it just something I want to do? I, I, I must admit, I, I've been involved in a few things like that, and sometimes I'm the problem. Uh, I have to check. I have to listen. I have to hear what other people say. And uh, sometimes... Conflict can be avoided if we'll just look in our own hearts and ask ourselves, is this biblical? Is this moral? Is this ethical? Well, it may not be any of that. What is it then? It's probably just your own preference, and uh, that's not a reason to divide up. And so uh, most church conflict is sinful. However, we are charged to fight heretics and heresies. There is a fight that we must engage in. In verse 18, the Apostle Paul returns to his subject, like I said, and he said, there were some certain men who were teaching different things, and he says, I want you to fight the good fight. In 1 Timothy 6.12, he tells him again to fight the good fight. The word fight there is our uh, word that we get uh, agonized from. The Greek word means to agonize. It, it doesn't mean that you go out there with a knockout punch. It means you wrestle with the guy or you wrestle with the issue or you wrestle over something. You agonize over it. You keep straining at it. You don't give up. And so Paul says to agonize over it. In 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul said when he was about ready to die, he said, I've been poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course and I have kept the faith. Paul's charge to Timothy, Timothy, who was the leader at the church at Ephesus, he says, Timothy, I want you to go to war against heretics. That's what this book is about is fighting against false doctrine. I want you to go to war against the heretics that are leading other peoples astray with their false teaching. Now, I hope you understand when I say go to war, I'm saying metaphorically. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not promoting violence. I don't believe in that. I, I'm using it like the Bible uses it. And that is, it means for Timothy to point out false teaching and false teachers and to stand up for the truth as proclaimed in the holy, infallible, inerrant word of God. And so the charge is to combat false teachers and their teaching, bearing in mind this is not given as a hypothetical situation. In other words, Paul's not saying, Timothy, you know, if some false teaching arises, it might be a good idea if you look into it. No, 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 no. This is not a hypothetical situation. This is a real situation, and Paul names, names. Did you notice that? Well, that's a no-no, isn't it? Well, that's what Paul did. That's what we should do. Uh, he names this guy. He names Hymenius. And like I said in, in uh, chapter 2 Timothy 2.16, he says, avoid this guy. Stay away from him. He, he says, avoid uh, worldly and empty chatter, which will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are this Hymenius. Timothy, you need to avoid this guy because he's peddling spiritual poison, and you need to marginalize him so that he don't infect everybody else in the church with it. That's what he's supposed to do. And then there's a guy named Alexander. Alexander. Now, we can't be certain which Alexander this is because we know there were two Alexanders in Ephesus. And uh, you can read all about him, Acts 19 and, and, and 20. But let me just say, there's one Alexander named Alexander the coppersmith. 
And Paul says in the latter part of 1 Timothy, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. And so uh, uh, Alexander the coppersmith was the head of the engraving guild or the union, if you will. And uh, in Ephesus, the, 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 the idol makers were going out of business because everybody's getting saved. And so they weren't selling their trinkets like they used to. And so this Alexander, the coppersmith, he's the one that led a riot. And so it's doubtful, it's doubtful that it's Alexander because every time Alexander, that Alexander is named in the Bible, he always gets the title, the coppersmith. So I doubt it was him, but there was another Alexander in Ephesus and uh, while the riot was going on, now you got a mixed group of people here. You got the church, you got the Pharisees, you got the Romans, and you got Jewish people, and you got all these people watching all this stuff. And so while the riot was going on, it says in Acts 19, uh, 33, some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward. Now, what's that about? Well, the, the idol makers were mad because they had burned up all their books and they were not buying their idols. And so they started a riot and they were shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they were about to go get all the Christians and uh, they were going to have them arrested or whatever. And the Jews were afraid they're going to confuse us with them Christian people. So they pushed forward this guy named Alexander to get up and speak on behalf of the Jews. But the crowd didn't let him speak. And, and, and Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defense before the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, all of them shouted in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Artemis and Diana are the same thing, male and female. So this Alexander, uh, whoever he was in Ephesus, must have been well-known. He must have been prominent. He most likely was a leader in the city and among the Jews. And he could have, and I'm supposing now, uh, he could have infiltrated the church after the apostle Paul left. Well, maybe it wasn't that Alexander, maybe it was. But the profile of this Alexander seems to indicate that a guy like him with, with smooth speech and influence in the community could become a teacher. And so knowing human nature, it's easy to imagine that an Alexander has the respect of the people already. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to go to war against these guys and their teaching. Now, uh, I, guess, I guess I can understand what a frightening command that might be. Because uh, uh, these guys are, are leaders, and Timothy, you got to take them out, man. You got, you got to, they're, they're ruining the church over there. So before we look at that, let's be clear about something. This is not a physical fight. We are not called to go to war with bullets and batons. Not only that, we are also not called to go to war against the world. Okay, the lost world is the lost world and they're always acting like they're lost and that's the way lost folks act. Somebody said, lost people are getting more sinful than they ever were. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're always been that way. Our battle is not against that. That's not what we, never does the Bible tell us to go to war against unbelievers. No, we're supposed to love them and win them. Our battle is not to change the culture. It's not to fix America. It's not to do any of that stuff. Our battle is to preach the gospel to every man, woman, boy, and girl and make disciples of all nations. The battle that we are told to fight is within the church. That's where we go to war. And it is a battle for doctrinal integrity and the word of God. We've got to hold up the Bible as the standard of all we do. That's what we do. In Jude, he says, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Contend. We've got to fight the fight. We're commanded to fight for the doctrinal integrity of the church. But now, like I said, that's the only fight we're called to fight. We're not to fight about things that are insignificant. We're not to push our own personal preferences up and turn them into doctrines. I'm going to give you one. Now, 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 have you been offended yet? If you're not, you're fixing to be, all right? Uh, 
Here's one I see all the time. That is a divisive issue that's being pushed forward all the time. This thing that goes around on the internet about uh, uh, why it's ungodly to sing anything except hymns out of the hymn book. Haven't made you mad yet? Okay, now listen. Here's the thing. I've read every bit of it. I've read all the arguments that people have, and they're all baloney. Every one of them. Here's why. There is nothing inspired inside of your hymn book. There's nothing inspired there. And God is giving music to new people. Here's what the deal is. People have personal preferences. And that's okay. Listen, if five of us got in the car and had to drive up to D.C., we'd leave the radio off because none of us would agree on the music. Amen? So just understand that it's personal preference and not doctrine there. That's not what we're supposed to be fighting about. We're not supposed to be fighting about colors and, 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 and times and schedules and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to thus saith the Lord and the written word of God, then brother, that's a fight worth fighting for. My, my granddaddy was, a, was a, 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 a preacher in a church. And uh, he had a man in that church that read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, at the end of it, it says that you, if anyone adds to or takes from the prophecies of this book, they're going to put the curses on them. I, I didn't quote it exactly, but it's something to like add to and take from. Well, this guy read that, add to and take from. And he told my grandfather, he said, I've noticed when we sing the hymns, sometimes if it's got four verses, we'll leave the third verse out. He said, the Bible says you can't add to or take from. He split the church over that. He got a following of people who thought that it was some kind of Bible doctrine that you had to sing all four verses of every hymn. Most fights, conflicts, spats, whatever you want to call them in church, are about that ridiculous. But the fight for the Word of God is ongoing, continuous, and it's never ridiculous. Now I want to talk about the cause of the heresy. Look in verse 19. He says, Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck concerning the faith. Another way of saying that is concerning the faith, they have made shipwreck. I think it's a good tense of what Paul is saying there. Concerning the faith, They've made a shipwreck. A shipwreck, a shipwreck is a catastrophic event. There's no good shipwrecks. There's not a good shipwreck. Uh, I imagine you're standing on the beach back in that day, and out on the, out on the ocean, you can see uh, where there's a great waste. And washing ashore are the remains of a once stately, confident sailing vessel. Something happened to cause the ship to break apart and an eerie scene of boards and sails and cargo and clothing along with bloated human bodies and animals are stretched out as far as you can see. That's what Paul's describing here. A shipwreck. It's a mess. And he says the ship is called the church at Ephesus and it sprung a leak because some of the false teachers there are perverting, twisting, and distorting the faith. And so, it's important. Now, the devil has always been twisting the Christian faith. And the devil uses unsaved men and women who are skilled at presentation to present false teaching. They're, 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 they're real good at twisting. I watch some of these religious programs, and these guys will start right here, and they'll just start... Little bit, little bit, little bit, taking a verse here, a piece of verse there, a word or two out of it. Next thing you know, they're way over here. It's got nothing to do with anything. But yet, the logic keeps you going. That's the way they work. And the church must combat heresy because it always causes division. In 1 Timothy 6, 4, Paul says, they have a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words which arise, envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. 
The church must combat heresy because it leads to more ungodliness. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy. I read in the, te- in the introduction. He said, avoid I- irreverent babble for it only leads to more ungodliness. Well, how's that? Paul said, irreverent babbling leads to more ungodliness. There's a preacher today in America who's got one of the largest churches. His name is Andy Stanley. Some of y'all may have listened to him. And he says some good things, but let me tell you what his recent thing was. He stood up in his church and said that the gay Christians at his church were the best Christians he had. And he said, his reasoning was that they are more dedicated because they came here after we've abused them for so many years and they just kept coming. They got to love Jesus more than the rest of us. Well, that's irreverent babbling is what that is. That's like saying, you know, those lying Christians, they're the best we got. And you can't ever tell when they're telling the truth, but man, I tell you what, they, they show up. Or how about those stealing Christians? Man, those thieving Christians, they bring a lot of money to the church, man. They're some of the best we got. You see how vain babbling leads to more ungodliness? Because in, instead of turning these people to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it just encourages them in their own Sin. And so the church must fight against, must combat heresy because it spreads like gangrene. Notice he says in 2 Timothy 2.17, their talk will spread like gangrene. I don't know much about gangrene. I don't, I don't want to know much about it. But I read that gangrene is a medical emergency in which blood stops flowing to a specific part of the body. And tissues in that area die. And although gangrene can affect any of your body's tissues, gangrene usually begins in the fingers, toes, hands, and feet. Without prompt treatment, gangrene is fatal. And in some cases, the only way to keep patients alive is to amputate the infected limbs. Paul wrote that he had already turned Hymenaeus and Alexander over to Satan. Now, what does that mean? Well, it most likely means he's excommunicated them. He's put them outside the church. It means they got no more, they can't teach anymore here. They can't, uh, they can't take part in church life. They can still come and hear teaching, but they're not going to be leaders here anymore. And notice why he did that. He said, I've turned them over in the last part so that they will be taught not to blaspheme, speak evil. Uh, uh, it means there that They've become a shipwreck concerning their faith, but I have put them out of the church so that they will be taught. It was a remedial action. It wasn't, he didn't send them to hell. He he wasn't trying to uh, hurt them in any way, but he says, I got to set them apart until they learn how to, 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 to act. And so the false teachers can't be allowed to teach their stuff in your church because they will turn the faith into shipwreck. And so uh, he says in 2 Timothy 2.18, they upset the faith of some. Uh, we we got to recognize that there are heretics who teach heresies. And if we intend to guard against them, we got to know what they are. And the Apostle Paul told the church at Ephesus when he left, guard yourselves, uh, be on guard yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Listen to this. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Here it is. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse, that's twisted, distorted. That's what he's talking about. Perverse things that draw away the disciples after them. Perhaps there was an elder in that group that was there praying on the beach with Paul. Perhaps his name was Hymenaeus. We don't know. Or perhaps they elected a new round of elders and deacons in their church, and one of them happened to be a guy named Alexander. And now, Timothy, you've been called there, and you've been called to deal with this guy or these people. I I don't know if you can understand what intimidation is, but, I mean, you got established leaders, and Paul, who's in prison when he's writing this letter, who's been accused of all kinds of stuff, is now telling young Timothy to address these older men and tell them they can't teach anymore in the church. No wonder Paul says God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of sound mind. 
It's because this is a daunting task. This is a humiliating task. This is a, this is a, this is a, a, a task that's going to require some backbone. You got to fight, Timothy. You got to fight. I tell you, sometimes people don't want to give up their territory. I, I, I went to uh, uh, Old Nancock Church. Wonderful ministry there. Uh, the second week I was there, there was a man in that church who, he's gone on to glory now. Uh, but uh, we came to an understanding, he and I. Uh, he, he, his understanding was to go to the Methodist church next door. <laughs> but uh, he introduced himself. He was a large man. He, he, he had the ability to change colors while you were talking to him. He could go from solid normal to bright red in the face, just, just like that. And uh, most everybody in the church was scared to death of him. And uh, this guy came walking into my office. I didn't even have books on my shelf yet. I was sitting there amongst the mess. He put one fist down, and he put the other fist down, and then he leaned over, and he said, well, I guess you've heard about me, haven't you? I had, but I didn't say so. I, I, I said, uh, what was I supposed to have heard about you? He said, I got the reputation for being the meanest man in this county. And I said, well, what makes you so mean? He said, I've had lots of practice. <laughs> he wasn't lying on that. But you know, these kind of guys will take over a church. And that's why Paul says, you've got to combat this stuff with the Word of God and with prayer. And so the church must combat heresy because it spreads and it kills like gangrene. Uh, false teaching causes pain and damage to other people. One of the saddest things I've ever seen was when the funeral director called me early in my ministry, 40 years ago, called 35 years ago, called me up one day and said, can you come down here? They, there's, a, there's a couple down here and their child has died. When I got down there, I met a, a, a man that just got out of the Air Force and, and they had a casket there this long. A casket this long. That's the saddest thing on the planet folks, a casket this long, and a terrible, terrible funeral. But here's, the, here's why it's so bad. After I got to know these people, they had lived out on the West Coast. They would gotten involved in a church that told them that God would heal their baby if they just had enough faith. Okay. The doctors told this, this couple that that baby was born with a, with a fatal heart defect and it would die within two days of being born. These people just kept telling her, claim it, uh, say it so, don't doubt for a minute. And she did everything she could do to have faith. Within a day and a half of that baby being born, it died. And her faith and his faith was destroyed because of false teaching. Now, it's not God's will to heal everybody of everything. If it was, we'd learn how to pray a right prayer, and we'd all just live forever down here, wouldn't we? So we'd never get sick. We'd just heal ourselves. I know that's crazy, but... People have misconceptions about what the Bible teaches on these things, and it's not just a difference of opinion. It matters in real life. And so it causes division. It leads to more ungodliness, and it spreads like gangrene and destroys people's lives. Now I want to just end by talking about the courage to fight heresy. I pointed out that Paul's instruction at the beginning, the introduction of his letter, included the word mercy. Pastors need a great deal of mercy, especially when they're confronting heretics and heresies. And Paul repeatedly reminds Timothy to fight the good fight. 
Paul reminds Timothy that we're called to suffer like good soldiers. Paul, it, 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 he says in 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but power and love and discipline. Therefore, don't be ashamed of me and the, the testimony of our Lord, uh, his prisoner, uh, but join in with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I see some things in verse 18 that Paul used to encourage Timothy, and I think they'll encourage us whatever fight we're facing. And here it is. The certainty of another's love encourages us. Notice what Paul says, verse 18. This command I entrust, and then he uses these words, Timothy, my son. Now, what is that? That is a, that is titles of a personal endearment. Paul is saying, Timothy, you're like a son to me. I know you by name. And, and, he, and he urges he urges him, and, and he says, listen, the, those old guys down there that don't like you straightening out their teaching, they may say bad things about you. They may talk about you. They may whisper about you. Other people are going to misunderstand you. But just know that I, for one, I'm rooting for you. It doesn't do good for you to know that there's somebody that is going to stand with you regardless of what happens. We all got to have somebody, man. Listen, Alexander Zolzaninsky was a prisoner in the Soviet prison in Siberia, and he became so weak and discouraged that he wished he could die. The guards would beat and usually kill anybody that stopped working. He decided that he would just stop working and let the guards kill him. And as soon as he did, as soon as he stopped working, another Christian drew a cross where Alexander could see it. Alexander said that, the, that, that he, encouraged, he was encouraged by remembering that God gives hope and courage, and he decided to continue because another Christian cared too much to let him give up. And that's what Paul is doing here for Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, I care too much for you, and I care too much for the church, and we're not giving up. I'm not giving up. Press on. Press on. The second thing he says, he uses is the assurance of God's promises encourages. He says in uh, verse 18, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, Paul continuously reminds Timothy of his ordination. When Timothy was ordained, there were prophecies that were made concerning his ministry. In 1 Timothy 4.14, 4, Paul again reminds Timothy, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterances and the laying on of hands by the presbytery or the elders. So again, Paul says, when you were ordained, we spoke the word of God over you. In 2 Timothy 1.6, it says, For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and sound discipline. So when Timothy was set apart, when he was ordained for the ministry, there was some prophetic speech that was spoken, and he was given a spiritual gift. Now, we're not told what, what anything that was said or what gift, but we can surmise that the gift and the speeches that were made over him were given to him as a way to prepare him for the ministry. I don't know what was said, but I'm sure it said something about uh, preach the word. I'm sure it had something about stay faithful. I'm sure it had something about regardless of what happens, stay true to Jesus. Paul repeatedly reminds Timothy of these prophetic uh, utterances and the commitments he made when he was set apart for, for God. In essence, by reminding Timothy of God's promises, Paul is also reminding Timothy that God is present with him during his time of trouble. Late in his life, the great missionary, uh, David Livingstone, he received an honorary doctorate from Glasgow, Glasgow University. When he got up to speak, he was thin and haggard, and he looked terrible from living in Africa so long. His left arm was crushed by a line, and it just hung uselessly by his side. As he announced his resolve to return to Africa without misgivings and with great gladness, 
He added, would you like to tell me, would you like for me to tell you what supported me through the years of exile among people whose language I didn't understand, whose attitude toward me was often uncertain and often hostile? You want to know what it was that kept me going and makes me go back? It is this, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. On these words, I stake everything, and they have never failed. Those words ought to be enough for us who are walking with Jesus Christ to attack hell with a water pistol. Amen. He is with us. He is with us. Number three, faith and good conscience encourages us. He says there, keeping faith and good conscience. Keep in mind the false teachers had strayed from those things and instead engaged in fruitless discussion. The false teachers' consciences are seared, he said, as with a branding iron. In other words, they don't care. They don't care how much damage and destruction they cause with their false teaching as long as they glorify themselves and get rich. That's what it's about. And we'll look at that later in chapter 6. There's a guy on television I was watching the other day. He runs a show pretty frequently. He claims he broke the back of poverty with a $68 seed. Y'all ought to laugh at some of this stuff, man. It, it, it's, just, it's just so funny. He says he broke the back of poverty with a $68 seed, and he hypes his message with testimonies of other people who, quote, released their faith. Anybody that tells you to release their faith is a false teacher. Faith is not an energy that you store up and shoot out of your ears like uh, a cartoon, okay? And so uh, 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 he, he, he does all this, he, he receives a $68 seed, go to your, he says, you got to do it. 200 people right now, I know if they will send me a seed, God is going to cancel your debt. He's going to give you back money. Blah, 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 blah. And you got to do it now before this program goes off. Use your bank card, use your credit card, charge your miracle if you need to. It don't matter. And he said, you got to do it before this show goes off because this anointing is only going to last as long as this program's on. And when it went off, I was reading down at the bottom. It was taped two years ago. <laughs> this anointing can be rerun. <laughs> Total absurdity. False teachers, false preachers are everywhere, man. Don't fall under their spells. These charlatans have no conscience. He says their conscience is seared with a hot iron. But Timothy, you are to have a good conscience. And faith, faith it means in this context means that you have confidence and you know what you believe. A good conscience means that you know that you are teaching the truth. And when you know that you're right with God and you know that you're teaching the truth, that gives boldness to the preacher. It gives boldness to the witness. It gives boldness to the Sunday school teacher. It gives boldness to the deacon to know that they're speaking, thus saith the Lord. It's like studying for a test. It's like, it's like uh, you know, if you studied for a test and you're ready to take it. I did that one time, and uh, it was amazing. I, the, 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 the test came, I wasn't the least bit scared. I, I, I had faith, I had confidence, because I knew the material. And, and I had a good conscience, because I knew I didn't have to cheat. <laughs> And I knew the material. And so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't worried. And so I, I aced the test. And my mind was prepared. Timothy, you know the truth. You stand for truth. Now go preach the truth. Church needs to stand against heresy and heretics. That guy I was telling you about when we started, he, uh, he became angry. He told me I had a religious spirit, whatever that is. And he, he quit the church. I mean, he, he was one of our leaders. He was, he was like the minister of music. And on Monday, he quit. By Sunday, I had to find somebody else. I, it, was, it, was a, it was a bad thing. And he disappeared. I, didn't, I, I heard things about him. 
the day I was putting my boxes in the truck to move to Virginia, I hadn't seen this guy in two years. He, pulled, he comes walking in my office. I was so shocked. He looked different, had a different attitude, had a different countenance. Everything about him was different. And he said, I, I need to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, you remember when you was telling me all this stuff was false doctrine, false teaching, false practices? I said, yeah. He said, you know, the whole time you were telling me that, I was just thinking, you just didn't know. You just didn't know. And he said, you remember when you were a kid and your daddy told you you couldn't do something? And you just felt like you had to do it to prove him wrong? I said, yeah, I remember that. He said, well, that's the way I was. He said, you was telling me the truth the whole time. And then he said this. He said, Pastor, I've been way out there. Man, I've been way out there. I'm ready to come back. Here's what's sad. Here's what's sad. This man was only in his 40s. He died, fell dead suddenly about two years later after that. And this is what's sad. He literally wasted the best years of his ministry engaging in fruitless discussions and false teaching. Beloved, we need to teach the truth. We need to teach the Word of God. In 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is called the pillar and support of of the truth. The pillars support the structure of the building. The church is not here for your entertainment. We don't use gimmicks. We don't draw, uh, use, use uh, shows to draw crowds. We don't promise miracles. We don't do fake healings at Southern Calvary Baptist Church. But what we do promise is that we will preach and teach the holy, infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Bow your head and close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Has there been a time in your life where you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ as Savior. I didn't say, did you join a church, become a, a something? That, that's, not, that's not, we're talking about getting saved now, being born of the Spirit. If not, in just a few minutes, we're going to begin to sing. And what I read to you was that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And it goes on to say in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you've never trusted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to, your, to, to the Lord and in your heart, would you just say some, dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I confess that I am a sinner. And today I want to turn away from my sinful lifestyle. I want to follow you. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you was buried. I believe you rose on the third day. I believe you're coming again, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save my soul. Now, if you just said that prayer, if you just said that prayer, in just a few minutes, we're going to begin to, pr- uh, to sing. We call that an invitation hymn. We're going to ask you to just step right out, walk up here. Pastor Brad's up here. We got deacons up here. I'll be up here. We'll pray with you. If you need to talk after church, we'll talk after church. But walking the aisle will not make you a Christian. But if you just got saved, you should confess him before men. And that's what the Bible teaches. In just a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation to him. Maybe you want to join Southern Calvary. You're already a Christian. You've already been saved, baptized. Then you can come forward and join this church. Uh, If you haven't been baptized and want to be, We're going to have baptism again real soon. Come forward. This is the time to make a decision. I'm going to pray.
Dear Lord Jesus, I pray, use this service for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.